Point Church family, welcome. Why don't we all stand together as we begin? Sing to our Lord together. There's just something about fills my heart with joy. There's just something about His name. Only one that I worship, only one I adore, only one my heart will praise. There's just something about His name. Sing Jesus. Jesus, lift up Jesus. Sing the
I'm a volunteer here at Calvary Monterey, and I'm just so glad to be here with you this morning on a bright, sunny day, worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is truly the way, the truth, and the life. And I just love being here with you, and I also love seeing new faces. And if you are new here, we are so glad you decided to join us. We would love to connect with you after service. We have a welcome center just out in the lobby, and there will be somebody there ready to answer any questions you might have, but also just wanting to get to know you, um, learn more about you, and help you learn more about Calvary and what we're all about here. And we also have a small gift we would love to give to you. There's a couple things that are going to be happening here at Calvary Monterey, and so we want to share this with you in the following video. Hey church, my name is Anne. I'm the outreach director here at Calvary Monterey. Um, and as some of you remember a couple weeks ago, Pastor Jeff and I had the great privilege of um, doing a missions and outreach update to let you all know what God let us do um, through your generous giving to our church um, in 2019. We've got a lot of big plans for 2020. And you can find out about all of the missionaries we support, the outreaches we're involved in, the church planters we've sent out by heading to the Proclaim wall. It's in the Welcome Center. There's a big sign that says Proclaim. You can't miss it. You can grab all kind of um, informational materials there to learn more. Another way to stay plugged in and involved that I'm excited about that's new this year is the Proclaim e-newsletter. So every month or so, I'm going to be sending an e-newsletter out, um, and it'll have updates and stories from our missionaries who are all over the world. Um, we'll feature some local outreach ministries and opportunities for you to get involved and support. So if that sounds interesting to you and you want to stay involved, you can um, sign up super simply by texting PROCLAIM to 41411, and it'll lead you through how to sign up. Or you can head to calvary.com slash outreach and learn all about what we've got going on. Hey church, just wanna let you know that today our life group registration opens. These groups are the best way to find community here at Calvary 
And it's our hope that in a small group setting like this, we would be able to follow Christ together. We wanted to show you an interview today with some past members and their experience with community that Life Group provides. So go ahead and check it out. We actually signed up during the first quarter, we signed up for the Life Group. And, I signed uh, up. <laughs> she, she forced me to come the very first quarter. Uh, and I say that jokingly, but it, it, it felt like that. It, it felt like I was being forced. When we first came to Monterey, um, as a family, we were having some struggles. We were having some difficulties. So, so for me, it was a negative thing. I didn't want to be there. I felt different. Like I felt like I couldn't connect with some of the people that, that I was going to encounter there. Um, and uh, boy, I was wrong. God had been working in our hearts to, um, to just make changes and um, signed up to the life group and the very first time I had the same mentality. I'm just gonna show up because she wants to be there. Um, and, and that's what I got out of it, nothing, right? Because I had a, a negative attitude. For some reason, I mean, not for some reason, I know that, that, that God was working in my heart and I came in with a completely different attitude and it was such a different experience. It felt like I had shown up to a completely different place. It was more like, all right, dude, you need some prayer for X, Y, and Z. We're gonna, we're gonna pray for you. We're gonna pray right now. And it just, from that point on, it was a completely different experience. It was good when I get there. And at first I was so quiet because I sometimes don't feel comfortable speaking English. I feel like oh, people is gonna judge if I don't say the right word or the, the right tense. Um, but little by little I was just like, this is family and I feel comfortable now. The time here goes by, by really fast. So um, take advantage of it, enjoy it. Get plugged in right away, don't wait and uh, you'll definitely have a much better experience in Monterey. Make sure you visit us after service today to register for a life group. The groups can fill up quickly, so don't wait. We'll see you there. So now we're gonna continue together worshiping um, through song, but also through tithes and offerings. This is an opportunity if you call Calvary Monterey your church home to give back a portion of what the Lord has given to you. If you are new here, if you're visiting, there's no obligation to give. You just pass the bag right along, it's no big deal. Um, so as we prepare our hearts to uh, just praise and worship our God in these ways, um, let's pray. Lord, we come before you just in worship, in praise of all that you have done, that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins, to make the sacrifice we could not make, to pay the debt we could not pay. Um, we are so thankful and so grateful, and we just want you to take this offering and use it to further your name, to proclaim who you are um, in this community, uh, through missions across the sea, uh, in our state, in our nation, Lord, to advance your kingdom however you have designed, Lord. And so we give this to you in trust, and we praise you in your most holy name. Amen. call upon your name you will answer you will say and deliver us in the darkness in the storm you are shining from the shore to deliver us, I deliver us, hallelujah, what a 
salvation written on his hand. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We sing, we sing your praise. And this hallelujahs to your holy name. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. And offer up this sacrifice for every sin. Our Savior died. The Lord of life can't be contained.
Lord is great. You are perfect and holy. In all your ways, you are good and gracious and merciful, long-suffering, willing that no one would perish. You want all to know you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your righteous ways in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that you'd open our eyes to see you better than we see you today. Lord, I We just sense, Lord, and believe that if like the saints of old, we caught a greater vision for you, for your holiness and majesty and goodness and justice, yet mercy, that we, Lord, would have a reverence for you, a fear of you, a respect of you that is healthy and good and right, which would live its way out in thousands of ways in our week-to-week experience with you. So, Lord, would you show us who you are? Would you help us, Lord, to a greater degree to, to know you, to see you? Thank you, Lord. We pray that you do that in us individually, but also collectively, Lord. Thank you. We pray that you'd continue to meet with us here this morning by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, church, you may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Love to say good morning to everyone over in Sanctuary 2 as well this morning. I got to last week, Pastor Jared Thompson was uh, teaching, and I got to actually come back late uh, Saturday afternoon, early evening, and then come to church at 11 o'clock last week, and we went to Sanctuary 2, Christina and I did, and we had a good time over there listening to Pastor Jared share the word. I thought that was just a great word for us to cast our cares and anxieties before the Lord. I was, I was like, when he opened up to 1 Peter 5, 7, I'm like, this guy is a pro, because when you guest speak, you kind of wonder, like, what should I share on? And it's like, go for worries. <laughs> like, everybody has them. Everyone will be happy to hear this scripture. So he just did such a great job last week, and I felt that that was a great word from the Lord for us. My family and I, we were down in Southern California for a few days last week, just hanging out together, uh, spending time in Disneyland, and they have the new uh, Star Wars land there called Galaxy's Edge. And some of you have asked me, did you go to Star Wars land? Did you like it or whatever? Well, actually, I have a picture for you. I met my long-lost brother there in (laughs) Star Wars land. And me and Chewie, we caught up, and it was great. He was actually he was just walking down the, the street, and I was like, I'm just going to stand right here, get a little selfie with him. And then later on, I was just standing at a completely random different time of the day, standing there with my daughters just talking. I felt this big hand on my shoulder, and I look up, and it's Chewie, and he grabs my beard. He just rubs my beard a little bit and just takes off. So we're tight, me and Chewie, and I think, I think we look a lot alike. Uh, I did want to reiterate, during announcements, we talked about the Life Group ministry. Today's the day to begin at least signing up for those. So you can go out to the registration tent after service or to calvary.com and uh, get yourself plugged in for this coming quarter. It's going to be a great one. So really looking forward to that and wanted to mention that. And today we're going to pick up our study in Mark. But before we do that, we actually have a really special thing that we get to do today as a church family. We did it at the 9 o'clock service, and we're going to repeat it at 11, and then again tonight at 6 o'clock. We get to ordain into pastoral ministry, Pastor Riley Monzo. So would you welcome him and his bride and a few of the pastors up onto the platform today? I am, uh, I am just so proud of Riley in, in so many ways. Riley... Uh, over the last three years has been going through a process with myself and with uh, many of the pastors on staff to determine his um, gifting and calling and um, ministry fit and has continually said, you know, I I, I consider and think that the Lord is calling me into a pastoral work. And as the years have passed by, we have just seen it time and time again. His life Uh, measures up with the first Timothy and also Titus requirements for a pastor. But what you are getting today is an absolute gift. It says in Ephesians chapter 4 that God gave to the church apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work 
of the ministry. In other words, those gifts are from Jesus who is seated in heaven for his people who are here on earth. And so today, in a sense, Jesus is giving to us as a church a really neat gift uh, from his heart named Riley Monzo. And, um, you know, the Bible says that, that pastors come in lots of different, you know, shapes and sizes. And one of the things that Paul talks about is pastors who are laboring in the word and doctrine. And Riley is one of those men. He has a call on his life to share scripture, to share the word of God. And God has gifted him to be able to do that. And he's also been faithful to develop that gift and that ability over the years. So he's not going to share anything today, but you're going to hear him more often from the pulpit sharing the word with us as a church. And this to me is a really special thing, partly because every pastor, I, I love them so much, but one of the things I admire about Riley is that he has come up inside of this church, which is a very, very hard thing for a man to do. It is much easier to grow up within a church, depart from the church, go into a different set of believers who don't know your history, your past, your background, can't. I mean, I still talk with people to this day who tell me that they changed my diapers back in 1979, you know, and stuff like that. And it's a challenge to break through all of that to do the ministry that God has asked you to do. And Riley has just determined that's who I'm going to be. God has called me to this place. He's called me to this church. He's called me to this fellowship. This is where I want to be. And I'm just very proud of him for pushing through all of that. And partly, in a sense, what I'm trying to do for you is to prepare you. The Lord has given you another pastor. You're going to receive from him at times. Now, his primary work right now is working with the young adults on Thursday night. Uh, but it's not just his ministry to them. It's also his ministry to all of us to help us because we need to be a church that loves young adults, that loves ministering to younger believers age-wise. And Riley will help us have some of the perspectives that are needed to conduct that ministry. So we are getting a real gift today, and I just wanted to frame that out for all of you. But I'm going to read to Riley a scripture from 2 Timothy chapter 4 and uh, implore him in ministry from it and see if he will do it. And if he will, then we'll ordain him today. Riley, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul said to Timothy, and I say to you, we say to you, we charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Rep reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. So Riley, the thing we want to know is that you will preach the word, that you will share it with us, that you will even rebuke and exhort us. We're inviting him to do that in our lives, in the word, to rebuke and exhort us, to give us sound teaching, to not teach us myths, but to rebuke myths and to continue to give us the word of God, and to even evangelize in the process, fulfilling your ministry. Will you do it? He said yes and amen. Why don't we all stand up together? And um, me and some of the guys are going to gather around Riley and his wonderful and very gifted bride, Chesley. And uh, she nodded yes. She's, she is very gifted. She knows. <laughs> Riley, is, is, is Joni here? Is your, is your mom here? You're not, she's not here yet. Okay, she'll be here tonight. Okay, great. <laughs> Riley's mom is the most godly person I've ever met in my life. So she'll be here tonight, and the whole holiness environment will increase when she comes in the room. I, I felt like it was a little lacking, like she probably wasn't in there. God, we just come before you, and we are so thankful for this couple and also this man. Thank you, Lord, for... So many years ago, by your sovereign hand and will, deciding that he 
would be born here on the Monterey Peninsula, that he would grow up in previous eras of this church's life, that he would hear your word and that you would touch his heart, that he would come to Christ. And as he grappled with his future, you would impress upon his heart in the quietness of the night, I've called you. I want you to serve me by serving my people, by loving them, by pastoring them, by teaching them. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for the way you've developed him over the years. And now, Lord, together as a church family, we commission him into your work. We are merely, Lord, recognizing what you have done. We have not done this, but you have done this. And we say yes and amen to it. And we pray, Lord, that the day would come where Riley would be an old man still preaching the gospel, still walking with you, still making disciples and handling rightly the precious word of truth that you have entrusted to us. Thank you, Lord, for this man. And as pastors, as a pastor, and as a church, we come before you and we rejoice and ask that you would bless this man in his ministry, Lord. Let him have a double portion of everything that you've done before and beyond. We thank you, Lord, and rejoice together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate. <laughs> Thanks, Chester. One more time. All right, what a joy. We actually ordained Riley uh, as pastors a couple of months ago in a pastor's meeting that we had, kind of an all-day planning and preparation meeting, and we kind of knew that it was trending towards him being ordained, and he was at the meeting, and when he was done sharing his portion and his vision and his heart for this next year, we were all just sitting there kind of in stunned silence like, if God hasn't called this guy to be a pastor, there's no one that he's called to be a pastor. It was just so sweet and so good. So I look forward to you receiving from Riley in the years to come. All right, let's turn to Mark chapter 1 today. We're going to get back in our study in Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 1, we've just got five verses that we're going to look at today. We'll probably start picking up the pace um, in the weeks to come. If you need a Bible, raise your hand in the air. But these first few sections in Mark's gospel kind of set the tone for the whole book. So today, just five verses, Mark chapter 1. Uh, let's read it together, starting out in verse 14. It says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And now our text, verse 16 and following, Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them in verse 17, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately... They left their nets and followed him, and going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Part of the reason I read the fuller text is because I wanted to remind you of what Jesus came declaring after John the Baptist was arrested by Herod. John had come preaching that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And when John was arrested, Jesus picked up that theme. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And that was a major statement that Jesus was making, especially in that day and in that era. You see, when Caesar was there on the scene, he preached what they would have called a gospel or a good news. And what they would have said is that Caesar himself was a son of God who came to bring the Pax Romana or a peace upon earth through the Roman Empire. So when Jesus comes along and says, there's a different kingdom, it's not the kingdom of Rome and it's not the kingdom of Caesar. And Caesar is not the son of God, 
but I am the Son of God who came to bring the kingdom of God. Repent and believe in this good news. It was a shocking word that Jesus uttered. He's asking people from everywhere and every place to turn around, to depart from the kingdom that they're in, from Caesar's kingdom and Caesar's way and Rome's way and Rome's peace into Jesus' kingdom, into God's family, into God's way. That's what the word repent means. It means turn around. You're heading in one direction, turn around and go in the other direction. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago, that it doesn't have to be an exclusively negative word with negative spiritual emotions that are attached to it. Woe is me, I'm such a terrible person, I must repent. But it's a turning around and entering into, embarking on the journey of the kingdom that Jesus came to establish. But you can hear that and kind of ask the question, what does that mean? How do I turn around and believe in this gospel, this good news of Jesus and the kingdom of God? How do I get engaged with it? How do I partake of it? You know, practically speaking, how do I embrace the kingdom today? And after Jesus made that statement in verse 15, Mark then immediately jumps into a description of Jesus calling his first four disciples. Now, here's what I don't want you to miss. I don't want you to miss the placement by Mark. You see, this is not Mark's way of saying, you know, I probably should just give you an interesting detail about how Jesus built his ultimate disciple ministry apostle team. One day, he went by the seashore, and he called four fishermen, and they came and followed after him. No, Mark puts it here in order to answer a question that should pop up in all of our minds. Can I get in on this? And if so, how can I get in on this? And the answer is right here in the lives of these men. In other words, we aren't meant to walk away today saying, good for Simon, good for Andrew, good for James, good for John. They got to follow Jesus, but we should walk away today saying, they are a template for me. I also can follow Jesus. I also can be a disciple of Jesus. I also can have him turn me into a fisher of men. So what I'm going to do today, we already read the passage, what I'm going to do today is just kind of talk about the scene, try to build it out a little bit for you. And then secondly, I want to consider for a moment Jesus' invitation, because we hear it through our Western ears and through our modern ears, but I'd like to try to rehear it from what they would have heard. How would they have understood Jesus' invitation? What did it mean to them? And then finally, I want to think about some of the benefits that are implied in the passage if we say yes to following after Jesus. Because if you're anything like me, some of Jesus' invitations into a life of discipleship, they can sound rather imposing or intimidating at times. Leave this, take up your cross, die to yourself. They can sound rather imposing. So I'd like you to see some of the great and impressive benefits that are found from following hard after Jesus. Jesus. So first of all, let's think about the scene. It says there in verse 16 that Jesus was passing alongside the Sea of Galilee. Now, you should get used to uh, that place, the Sea of Galilee, because the first half of the Gospel of Mark is going to center around this place, this body of water, the Sea of Galilee. Sometimes in a city around the Sea of Galilee, sometimes a region in the wilderness near the Sea of Galilee, but the first half of Mark's gospel is going to center around the Sea of Galilee. Now, what you should have in your mind, how, how many of you, have any of you ever been to Israel before? You've been to Israel before? Yeah, so you, if you went there, you saw the Sea of Galilee. I'm just curious. I'm, how many of you would like to go to Israel someday? Wouldn't that be cool? I think the Bible teaches you all will at some point if you're a Christian, but uh, it is impressive to go to uh, Galilee and to kind of just see this place. It's not a massive lake, though it is fairly large. It's 13 miles long from north to south and about seven miles wide from east uh, to west. It's very serene. 
uh, lots of times. And in Jesus' era, it would have had a thriving fishing industry that was taking place inside of it. The water in the Sea of Galilee comes from the Jordan River, but also from Mount Hermon. The snow that would melt off of Mount Hermon would come down into uh, the Sea of Galilee, and then the outlet of the Sea of Galilee was also the Jordan River, much bigger at its outlet than at uh, its inlet. And it's not an alpine or high elevation lake. It's actually 700 feet below sea level. And if you were to stand on the beach in Israel, on the Mediterranean, and head east 20 miles, that's how long it would take for you to hit the Sea of Galilee. So not terribly far uh, from the coast. The point I'm trying to make is that it's a very real place. In fact, you could actually Google it. You could go to Google Maps and you could punch in the Sea of Galilee. I did this last week. And what I discovered is that people give it four and a half stars. It gets a 4.5 <laughs> stars on Google Maps. I was reading some of the reviews. There's a guy named Doug. Last week he said, went out on the lake, had a spiritual experience in a boat. The boat owner was a famous rapper. That was his review of the Sea of Galilee. So I'm just trying to say it's a very real place. This isn't a mythical place. It's a very real place that we can find uh, today. Okay, so Jesus, he goes there to the Sea of Galilee, and he comes across a first set of brothers. One is named Simon, and the other is named Andrew. Now, Simon will be referred to as Simon until Mark chapter 3, and then he'll be referred to by the nickname that Jesus gave to him, Peter, which means rock. And more than likely, Simon, or Peter, is the source for the material that Mark wrote. Okay, so he sees Simon, and then he sees his brother, Andrew. And there they are, they're, they're fishing, they're fishermen. Uh, the way it reads is not that they were in a boat, more than likely, but that they were probably either on the shore or standing waist deep in the water, and they were casting their nets. And what this would have been was a net that was maybe 20 feet wide a, uh, in, in a, a circle in shape with weights around it, and you'd throw it like a disc out into the water, and the weights would cause the net to sink and trap any fish that were caught underneath it, and then there would be a pole rope that the fishermen would pull maybe onto the boat or onto the shore and the net would collect into a sack, so to speak, and would catch all of those fish that they'd then take and buy and, and, and sell throughout that region. And so Jesus sees these two brothers. He says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And they leave everything immediately, Mark says, and they follow Jesus. Then Jesus goes along and he sees another second set of brothers. Uh, their father was a man named Zebedee, Mark tells us. They had a fishing business together. They were not casting their nets, but mending their nets, perhaps to prepare to cast their nets out in the water, because apparently it was the time for doing that. That's why Peter and Andrew were casting their nets. And Jesus came to them. Their names were James and John, and he asked them to follow him as well. And they left their father, they left the business, and they immediately went and followed after Jesus. Now, in later studies, we're going to get a chance to think about all of Jesus' disciples, the ministry team that he built, so I'm not going to really talk about them at this point, but the one thing that I will say is that these four seem to have formed Jesus' inner circle for ministry. He had the 12, but every time you see the 12 listed, they are written in different orderings except for there's a group of four, another group of four, and another group of four. And the first group of four, sometimes written in different order, but always it's the same four. It's always Peter, it's always Andrew, his brother, it's always James, and it's always John. Now, many of you know that there are times that Jesus that would then break away to do something special. Maybe pray in the Garden of Gethsemane, go to the Mount of Transfiguration, or go into a house to raise a little girl from the dead. And in scenes like that, he would bring only three of these four. He'd bring Peter, he'd bring James, and he'd bring John. We don't really know why he didn't bring Andrew. Andrew was clearly part of his inner team, but we don't know why he didn't bring Andrew. My personal theory is that he needed Peter and James and John so that he could keep an eye on them and that Andrew would stay and keep an eye on the rest of the disciples. Andrew comes across as a real trustworthy individual all throughout uh, the Bible, all throughout Scripture. 
Now, here's what I want to mention before we move on from the scene. We might be tempted to think of this as a, a massively shocking event. And I don't want to undersell the fact that these men did leave everything in an instant to follow after Jesus. But I think oftentimes, whether it's through the children's Bibles that many of us grew up reading or just our natural reading of the text, sometimes we come to the conclusion or we would think in our mind that there was no backstory. You know, that Jesus just kind of appeared, Mark places it pretty quickly after the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. And so Jesus one day just rolled by the beach there in the Galilee, probably near Capernaum, saw these four guys, they'd never seen him in their lives. Uh, He spoke to them, follow me, and they're like, random stranger, don't even know who you are, but we've got like no questions and we're just going to follow you. We're going to get rid of our businesses and tell our wives like, hey, we'll see you in three years. Like, we're just going to do that because we just have a feeling (laughs) that we're to follow you because of the power that's there. But John's gospel gives us some backstory. Uh, Apparently, Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. And one day Jesus passed by when John the Baptist was still doing his ministry and John said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And Andrew began following Jesus. Then Andrew went and got Peter. They, they had nights with him where they interviewed Jesus. And then Jesus went into the region of Judea and performed miracles and preached and did ministry. So there's a season where Jesus is operating, and these men, though in relationship with him, though they know him, they're not yet really following him as his disciple. Now, after building that relationship out, Jesus comes to them and says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And part of the reason I like pointing that out is because I think for many of us, we would just say, you know, it feels like an impossibility that I would just, out of thin air, have Jesus say to me, be my disciple. And without any backstory, without any knowledge, I would follow him. But I think our story is more like their story than we might think. Jesus working in their lives, Jesus making his name known, and then Jesus coming to them at some point and saying, listen, I'm looking for disciples. I'm looking for men who will build my kingdom, who will bring people into this kingdom, who will fish for men, and I'm asking you to be part of that mission. And so for us today, as we approach this text, text, that's the question. Do we want to be followers of Jesus? Do we want to be his disciples? But before you say yes to that, let's think secondly about the invitation itself. What did he say? Let's look at it in verse 17. He said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Really, you could kind of boil the invitation down even further, couldn't you? Because the second part of it is just his promise of what would happen if they did the invitation, if they accepted the invitation. What's the invitation? The invitation is, follow me. Follow me. One thing that you notice is lacking are lots of details on what's going to happen if they follow him. You need to know this about Jesus. He is not obliged to, nor does he prefer to, give us all the details of exactly what's going to happen if we submit ourselves to him and his path of discipleship for our lives. I remember when I was a boy, one of the things that I loved doing when I was like middle school age is I loved when, whether it was through a youth group or a school trip or my family, we'd get to go to a water slide park. You know, I loved doing that, you know, and I loved all the thrills and all of that. But one of the things that I remember is what it was like to wait in line for some of those more popular water slides. You had all these stairs and uh, balconies just climbing all the way up to something up there, you know, in the air. And the whole time you're climbing up, you know, if you're with your buddies, you're like watching the slide. You're like memorizing every turn, every little shoot, every little drop. You're laughing when people lose control, you know, and, and uh, you know, have to bail out or something. You know, you're, you're, you're like, man, I can't wait to do that. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go so fast. You're kind of preparing yourself for that moment. And then you finally get to the very top. The lifeguard looks at you. Okay, come into the water, gives you the signal, and it's time for you to go down the thing that you've observed, the thing that you've watched. 
But imagine what it would be like to be brought magically without seeing the journey to the very top where there they are just saying, it's time. Will you come in? That is more similar to Jesus' call upon these disciples and upon us. He says to us, look, I can't give you all the details. You couldn't even handle all of the details, but what I'm asking you to do is to follow me. Go on this journey with me. Enter into it with me. Follow after me. Now, one of the reasons why this was really special for Jesus to do is because rabbis in that era had disciples this was not a new thing a teacher having disciples but what was new is that rabbis in that era would not choose their disciples but the disciples would choose their rabbi in other words if you were in israel at the time and you were a a person who was learning and listening to various teachers you would consider the different teachers and the outcomes of their teaching and you would choose who to attach yourself to. And this is how some rabbis became very popular and followed by the masses and how others were less known. But Jesus comes along and he doesn't do it that way. He doesn't wait for the disciples to choose him. He has a small select group that he chose for himself. And even when the masses were coming to Jesus to follow him, he still kept his disciple group, his apostolic band, at the number of 12. But the other thing that's interesting that made Jesus different is that Jesus asked them to follow him. You see, rabbis in that day did not say that. They did not say, follow me. What they asked their disciples to do was to consider their teaching of the Torah or the law of Moses or scripture and to follow the scripture, to follow the Torah to follow the law of Moses. But Jesus comes along and says to these potential disciples, it isn't that I want you to follow the Torah. It isn't that I want you to follow the law of Moses. I'll share about the law of Moses with you. I'll interpret the scripture for you. But I want you to first follow me. And as you follow me, you'll actually end up following the right representation of scripture this is an implied massive christological claim if you really think about it because if anyone were to ask for allegiance like this and not be the son of god we should be appalled it'd be outrageous for anyone else to stand up a a rabbi to stand up in that era and say hey everyone else all the other rabbis they want you to follow the scripture, to follow the Torah, but I want you to instead follow me. Leave everything, abandon everything, and follow me. It's an insane ask unless the asker is the son of God. And for that, I'd remind you how the book of Mark began. Remember it? Mark 1, verse 1. It's right there in your Bibles. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. God. In other words, it's an appropriate ask if Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, but let's think for a second about what they heard when they heard, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. What did they hear specifically when Jesus said, follow me? Because if a leader came to us today, like let's say a professor or a teacher or a pastor or a parent or someone, a CEO, they came into our lives and they said, follow me. We probably wouldn't respond like the disciples responded. You know, we probably wouldn't say like, well, well, I I would love to follow you. Let me go get my sleeping bag. We'll live together for the next three years. Like if a CEO said, follow me, trust me, and you did that, they'd be like, I got a different department of the company for you to work in. You don't need to pack your sleeping bag to follow after me. But, But that's how they interpreted what Jesus said. They followed him with everything. You see, in those days, when, a, when you followed a rabbi, which is what Jesus became for these men, you would do three things. And we're going to look at these three things together. You would, number one, be with your rabbi. Number two, you would imitate your rabbi. And number three, you would do what your rabbi did. In other words, it was training. It was discipleship it was like an apprenticeship imagine if you will like a carpenter a master carpenter 
and he or she has their skills, and they bring on an apprentice who doesn't know carpentry. But as an apprentice, they are meant to learn. They're going to be with the master carpenter. They are going to begin imitating the master carpenter, copying the way the master carpenter works until eventually they can take on jobs on their own and they can actually do the things that the master carpenter can do. That's the idea. Jesus and his disciples, they would be with him, spend time with him, just watch him. They'd then imitate him until eventually they reproduced many of the things that Jesus did himself. So let's consider these things. What does this look like? Number one, be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. That's what they were called to. That's what we're called to. And how did they do this? You know, they just followed Jesus everywhere, didn't they? You know, they traveled with Jesus. They listened to Jesus teach. They watched his miracles. They talked with him. You know, they got to act like they understood what he was saying, you know, out in public. And then in private, they'd say, we had no idea what you were saying out there. <laughs> what did that mean? You know, they got an inside look at Jesus and his ministry. But they were just with him. You know, to, to me, this is so a, appealing. Just the idea of getting rid of so many of the distractions in order to be with Jesus. Because we live in a, in a frenetic time, a frenetic world, I think. Time is a precious commodity for us. And it feels like we barely have any of it at times. I know for me, even some of my best friends, it's not uncommon to go weeks or months uh, in between any real significant contact with even some of my closest friends. Life can just be so busy for all of us. I remember saying to Pastor Mike just a couple of months ago, right before Christmas, I said, Mike, I can't wait for heaven, partly because I know you and me, we're going to get a chance to hang out there. Because <laughs> it's just so much of life, you're just moving and going. But here is Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, I want you to be with me. I just want you to pull away, engage with me. And that's what they did. They broke away and they gave their time to Jesus. It just sounds amazing to me to have an opportunity like this. Now today, we do actually have this opportunity. He is calling us to be with him. Now obviously, Jesus is not here in the flesh any longer. You know, at that time, there were major parts of the world that had no idea that Jesus was even walking the earth. And he couldn't be of benefit to someone that's living in Rome while he walked around on the shores of Galilee. At least not in a personal kind of way, interacting with them on a personal level. But Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father and poured out his spirit so that he can now be ever present here on earth in the form of his Holy Spirit. And we have to have this kind of understanding of the spiritual dimension to walk by faith and not by sight if we're really going to spend time with Jesus today. Like I said, you can't touch him. You won't sit across from a campfire from him. But through things like silence and solitude and prayer and fasting and Sabbath and study, we can spend very real time in a very real and significant way with Jesus. Not just ceremonies or rituals that we go through or spiritual disciplines that we perform, but engaging with him in those moments to in a real way sense his closeness when we open our bibles or our mouths in prayer so we've got to have that we've got to have times that we set aside to simply be with jesus now some christians will refer to the portion of their day where they open the bible and spend time in prayer maybe write some prayers out they'll they'll talk about that as devotions their personal devotions but the reality is Every human being is devoted to something. Every human being has devotions. The question is, will we be devoted to, pointed to Jesus? All right, so we have to be with Jesus. But the second thing uh, that they would have done is they would have just begun to imitate Jesus. And we're called to this. We're called to imitate Jesus. The disciples, what did they do? You know, they kind of watched Jesus' life, and eventually 
had a goal of imitating his life. You know, when Jesus shared his thoughts about things like money or the Bible or the sick, his thoughts and his attitudes slowly became their attitudes. They were, they were being apprenticed in the way they were to think about these things as Jesus taught them. So they'd watch how he forgave people, or they'd watch his meekness and humility, or they'd watch how he interacted with women and brought them into his ministry team. They'd watch him stand up to religiosity and oppressive worldviews. They watched him pray. One day they even came to him and said, teach us how to do that. We're watching you pray. We want to be like that. They wanted to imitate Jesus' way of life. When Jesus would teach things like the parable or the story of the good Samaritan, they came to the conclusion, Jesus is the one who is like the good Samaritan. That's Jesus. That's who we know. And they wanted to be like him. Slowly over time, they began to discover that Jesus was the bullseye, the aim, the goal for their Christian life and experience. They wanted to be like him. And we too are called to imitate Jesus. So when we see Jesus walking in step with his father, praying to his father, it means that we're meant to be in constant communication with our father in heaven. When we see Jesus weeping over lost and broken humanity, weeping them for over them like sheep who have no shepherd, we should want that same spirit and heart to enter in to us. When we see Jesus' hunger and thirst for holiness, combined with his utter disgust for hypocrisy, we too should pursue a consistency between our beliefs And our lifestyle, we should want that, crave that, because we see it in Jesus. But finally, the disciples did what Jesus did. And this is where it all is supposed to take us. Remember, you know, they hung out with Jesus. They spent time with Jesus. They imitated Jesus. But remember, Jesus didn't remain on earth forever. He died, rose from the dead, appeared, and ascended back to the right hand of the Father. And then these disciples and those who followed them began actually doing the things that Jesus did. There were stories in the Gospels and in the book of Acts of them having power over the demonic realm. There were stories of them helping and reaching out to those who were sick and infirm. They preached the Gospel. They went to those who were hurting and in pain and disenfranchised. They found those who were at the lowest point and they preached the gospel to them. They found places where people were thirsty for the message of Jesus. And they proclaimed the gospel and the kingdom. You see, we're called to this life, you guys. We're called to launch out into ministry with Jesus. There will be a rare few, like Riley, who we prayed for a little bit earlier today, who are called to a full-time work for the gospel. But for the vast majority of believers, we're called to live the disciple life inside of our careers and families and friendships and communities. So we're to look for hurting kids. We're to look for opportunities to serve the sick, to minister to the forgotten, to proclaim the good news of Jesus to everyone. I mean, think about it. What did a fisher of fish want? as many fish in the boat as possible. What do fishers of men or fishers of people want? As many souls in the kingdom as possible. And we get to, Jesus is showing us, engage in this work. Now, before I look at some of the benefits of following Jesus like this, I just want to mention that there is a difference in the Bible between the word Christian and the word disciple. We have, I think, divorced the words, but they should be converged together. Uh, The word Christian is a fine word. It's in the Bible. It's used, I think, three times throughout the New Testament. Usually, it's spoken by non-believers referring to believers, uh, calling them people who are like Jesus, those Christians is kind of what they were beginning to be known as. But usually, when the Bible talks about us, talks about believers, it's not Christians that we're referred to. Usually, we're referred to as disciples. Disciples. People who have embraced Jesus as our teacher, the one that we're with, that we imitate, who then we then go out and do the work that he 
did. And when I say it like that, wouldn't you say that what the world needs is not more Christians, but more disciples, more apprentices of Jesus, more followers of Christ who've been with him, who've imitated him, and who do what he did. I think that's what our world needs more of than just people who have made a specific profession that is Christian. All right, with all of that being said, let's just think for a moment about some of the benefits of following Jesus as a disciple. Like I said earlier, I think it can be a little intimidating. You know, here are these guys leaving everything to follow Jesus. Like, we kind of wonder, like, is that what it's going to mean for me? Am I just going to have to leave life as I know it and follow Jesus? We kind of can get that concern in our hearts. Jesus has severe things to say about this. He talks about leaving family and brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers to follow and pursue him. He talks about taking up your cross and following after him. That's not a very popular thing to do. You know, if you're a guy trying to build a movement to say like, hey, here's what it's like to follow after me. Let me search for an example. Oh, crucifixion. You know, that's usually not what you would say to try to gain a following, but Jesus is very honest with us. But the question would be, is there a benefit? Is there a benefit? Well, it's implied right here in the passage, and I'll show you three great benefits that we receive from allowing ourselves to submit to Jesus and become his disciples. Number one, the first one is significance. These men went from fishing for fish, which, you know, that's cool, but they got to become world changers who fish for the souls of human beings. You know, they were casting their physical nets into the water, but one day they would cast their evangelistic nets into the souls or the sea of humanity. And God would start a movement through them that was so incredible. And I think so many people are searching for significance here in life. And many people are toiling under a worldview that has been, at least in part, built by the theory of naturalistic evolution. And that worldview leads someone to conclude, what's the point of all this? I'm just some random, incredibly random accident that's occurred. What's the point of my existence? And some people have built a worldview or a structure for themselves that has brought them some semblance of happiness, but here Jesus invites us into the deepest meaning and significance of all. Lives that can make an eternal difference. It can make kingdom expansion possible. So we're to, we're to long for this, pray for this, and work towards the evangelization of the nations. You know, like I said earlier, fishermen want fish in the boat. Disciples want as many people in the kingdom as possible. And I'm telling you, you guys, when when this begins to grab hold of your life, if it hasn't already, those of you who it has grabbed hold of your heart and hold of your life, you know that it changes your every interaction. I've watched various believers in my time treat other people very poorly, and I think sometimes it stems from a lack of discipleship. They don't know that they are supposed to be on a mission with Jesus to see people get to know Jesus and come into the kingdom of Jesus. But your every relationship can be transformed and given meaning and purpose when all of a sudden you begin to discover, no, Jesus wants me to become a fisher of men. It can transform the way that you relate to and interact with other human beings. Now, I'm not saying that you can't have a friendship with a non-believer simply because you just like them. I tell my friends that I have that are not in Christ, I like you. I'll, I'd love to talk with you about the Lord anytime that you'd like, but I also just like you. I like spending time with you. I, I, I believe in this message so much, I want the whole world to know it, but also, if you're not down to talk about it, know that I love you and I care for you. I'll keep praying for you and I'd love to spend time in your presence and with you. But like fishermen who want fish in the boat, we want people to be in the kingdom. But another benefit of following Jesus like this is that of direction, direction, guidance for life, 
so to speak. You know, Jesus comes along and he says to us, follow me. You know, there, there are so many opinions on how we should live life. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed this. You, you can't open your phone. You can't get onto your social media. You can't do hardly anything these days without getting philosophies for life thrust in your direction. And so often they come from our own minds. And we live in an age where there's infinite choices on how to live life and what to be about. And if you're anything like me, sometimes it feels rather stressful. You know, how how am I supposed to live? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to value above all else? And then Jesus comes along and he says, "I I don't want you to worry about any of that. I want you to follow me. Just follow me. Just let that be your pursuit. So I'm not to follow myself. I'm not to follow others. I'm not to follow society. I'm just to follow Jesus. And when I really embrace this, it's like a weight rolls off my back. I can start asking, what does Jesus say? What does Jesus think? How does Jesus want me to build my life? For me, I feel like I've waited my whole life for someone to just come along and say, this is how you do life. It just feels so good to hear that from Jesus. Follow me. Follow me. But the last benefit I want to point out to you that we get from Jesus when we follow him in this way is we get the incredible benefit of his personal transformation in our lives. In other words, he will change us. Notice how he said it there in verse 17. He said, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. In other words, he would do the work over time as they hung out with him of changing them to be like him. He would change them. He would transform them. Other rabbis couldn't do this. Other rabbis would point to their teaching and then say, do it. But Jesus says, I'll teach you. I'll lead you. I'll guide you. Follow me. But I will make you become fishers of men. And one way that he primarily does this is by the sending of his Holy Spirit to live inside of those who believe in him. So now as we fellowship with him, he transforms us to become like Jesus. Like it says in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Changed to become like Jesus. To to become, through a process, like him. And it was amazing. And we're going to watch this play out in the lives of these disciples. These men who were rough fishermen at the beginning are going to turn into apostles, men who are preaching the gospel and changing the world by the end of their time with Jesus. He would truly make them become fishers of men all right lastly let's just think about this these guys then made a decision didn't they they decided you know they could have said no thanks we don't want that we're going to continue on with our fishing business and enterprise it's funny some scholars try to paint these guys like really poor individuals who didn't have much money and they just you were looking for something to do but the reality is they had a business they had uh, workers a staff and it seems that they were at least in the middle class of that era in that time and they made the decision we're, we're gonna do it we're gonna we're gonna follow Jesus they were strengthened by God to be able to say yes uh, to this call from the Lord and we could talk about a lot of things and just kind of thinking about the way they said yes and I could implore you in a lot of different ways we could think about why we should say yes. We could focus on how they left family or left careers. But instead, I just want to say it like this. This is not very profound. It's very easy to come to this conclusion. I'll just say it like this. This decision was the best decision of their entire lives. It was the best decision of their entire lives. They may have doubted it at certain moments during Jesus' ministry. When things got tough, when Jesus was arrested, when Jesus was crucified, there may have been moments where they wondered, did we just waste our time? Did we just make the right decision? But as the years ticked by and as God used their lives, as they looked back and saw the fruit, people who'd come into the kingdom, as they watched all of that, they would have said, at that moment when Jesus walked on the seashore and we were minding our own business, casting or mending our nets, and we said yes to him, 
that was the best decision of our entire lives. Everything changed from that point forward. We didn't know what was going to happen. We could have never predicted it in a million years, but it was the best thing we could have ever done. And I say it, of course, that way to all of us today, because if there's any fear in your heart about truly following Jesus, being with him, imitating him, and eventually doing what he did, there's fear in your heart about his call to your life saying, be my apprentice, be my disciple. I want you to know from their lives that it is the best decision you could possibly make. I think human beings, we fall into a couple of camps. One camp is the camp that has built life the way we wanted to build life. And the other is the camp that has built life according to Jesus and his plan, following after him. And I think it's the best life we could possibly live. So my prayer is that we would all ever increasingly decide to follow Jesus. Okay, let me conclude by just giving you a handful of applications and then I'll get out of your hair. Number one, I want you to see Jesus as your Savior but also your example. See Jesus as your Savior but also your example, or maybe I could say it also your goal, the one that you want to emulate and be like. Too many believers have only seen Jesus as their Savior. They've believed in the basics of the gospel message, the cross of Christ, forgiveness of sins, and have thought that Jesus hasn't wanted more from their lives, but he does. He wants them to have a goal, an ambition, a desire to become more and more like him. So see Jesus as your Savior, but also see him as your example or goal, or aim. Number two, give Jesus every day by giving him a portion of each day. I think when we say, I want Jesus to have my life, one way to live that out more practically is to give him a portion of each day, not in a way of saying, Lord Jesus, this is your part of the day, and you don't get the rest of the day, but as a way to say, I want this whole day to belong to you. And I'm going to sit with you, engage with you, pray to you, uh, so that this whole day can be yours. Number three, see prayer, fasting, solitude, and study as ways to be with Jesus. Like I said earlier, these are spiritual disciplines, are classically understood that way by the church, but also see them as ways to spend time with your Lord. Number four, ask the question, how would Jesus think? How would Jesus think? When various ideas are proposed to you, various concepts come across your mind, ask the question, how would Jesus think? Number five, be open to Jesus rearranging your life. This is the scary one sometimes, isn't it? You know, to just think about, like, if Jesus had wholesale leadership of my life, what kind of freaky thing might he make me do? But if you really want to be his disciple, ever increasingly, you've got to get to that place of saying, Lord, you know, whatever you want for my life, I'm willing to follow you. And then number six, tell him that you'll follow him. Make that commitment. Say, Lord, I hear your voice. You're saying, follow me. I'll make you become a fisher of men. And I, Lord Jesus, want to to follow you. So can I lead you in a prayer this morning? Because I think some of you, you might be saying to yourself today, you know, I know the Lord, but I've not been a disciple. And I'd like to be. I'd like to hear his voice, and I'd like to say, yes, Lord, I will follow you. And if that's you, I want to lead you to pray for that. So Lord, we come before you this morning, and we pray and ask that you would help us, Lord, to be followers of you. Not, not just a person that comes on a Sunday or has a religious experience here or there. A person familiar with the tenets of the gospel, but Lord, someone who has received all that you are and has said, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. And Lord, we confess to you so many times, even after we've said yes to following you, we've gone our own way. We've done our own thing, and we confess that to you, Lord. We repent of it today, and we turn afresh to follow you. And if that describes you today, you know in your heart it's time to take 
following Jesus seriously. And as we go through Mark's gospel, you're wanting to learn of him so that you can be with, imitate, and do what he did. Then say that to him today. Say, Lord, yes, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Please, Lord, we pray. Let our fellowship ever increasingly be filled with more and more imitators of Christ. Not the legalistic, in our own power and strength kind, but the by your spirit transformed by you kind. Please, Lord, we pray. We thank you. We ask that you would do this in our lives. Thank you for this incredible invitation. There is nothing like it. We love you for it. In Jesus' name, we pray together. Amen. Amen. All right, church, have a wonderful week. We'll see you on Tuesday night for Genesis.